two, Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. I'm seeing participants load in. And this is our Soil Food Web School January webinar series. This is the place where you can connect with the Soil Food Web movement. And um, you'll note that this is the third of our four part webinar series. And the third webinar we're calling Soil Health Success Stories, especially focusing on a market garden operation in California. I'm very excited to learn this today. So I see that some people are already uh, doing what I was about to tell you to do, which is please introduce yourself in the chat. Um, let us know where you're coming from today. We love to see folks from all over uh, the world. Oh, look, someone from Lebanon. I think that might be our first uh, our first time I've seen that. Um, but we at yeah, Norway, people are just loading into chat. This is great. So. Um, I just want to put this in context. I mentioned this is the third webinar series or the third webinar of the series. And so you can tune back in to um, catch the fourth webinar on the 31st. And the replays of our first two webinars are available on our YouTube channel. So let me just um, explain a little bit about how this is going to go today. Oh, is everybody seeing my slide? Okay. It looked a little weird on my computer for a second. Um, just to give you some guidelines about how we're, we're going to um, do the webinar today, uh, all of you in attendance will be muted the entire time. Uh, that's just so that we don't end up with, you know, background noise <clears throat> that makes it hard for people to understand uh, today. And then if you have a question that you would like the panel to answer at the end, there's a special button for Q&A um, that is in your zoom panel it's right next to it's right between chat and um maybe share screen <laughs> that's what it looks like on mine so please give us questions there if you want the panel to have a chance to answer them at the end if you want to converse with each other or ask general questions um we'll try to monitor the chat as well uh, but if you put it in chat it doesn't necessarily um get on our radar to answer that question as a panel and this is the kind of timeline of what we'll be going through today. Um, we'll do introductions here of everybody that's going to participate in today's webinar as panelists and presenters. And then you'll hear primarily from Jen today and some interjection, I think, by Brian, which um, is always something I look forward to, to hear from Brian, um, about the uh, Sonaterra Farms. And then we'll we'll have a brief video about the January offer as part of the promotional webinar series here. And then we'll have um, 55 minutes or so uh, for Q&A at the end. So, oh, we got folks from Trinidad and Tobago, or I should I say Tobago. I always, I think my friends from there have said it's Tobago with a hard A and Spain. So this is very exciting. Now you've probably uh, heard enough from me, and so what I want to do is pitch this to some of our uh, my other illustrious panelists today, uh, starting with Jen. So please um, introduce yourself to the group, Jen, and then we'll go around in this order and give everybody a chance. Sure. My name is Jennifer Brand, and I am a farmer in Northern California. I've been farming for this will be my fourth season now, and I just have a small site. I do. Um, fresh vegetables and cut flowers. And I sell at a local farmer's market and I do a little bit of online selling during the midweek. Great, thanks, Jen. Uh, I'm Brian Bank. I am a SFW, Soil Food Web Consultant. Um, really two companies. Uh, my, my company I started with was Sprouting Soil and I still have that. And then I've joined forces with uh, Keisha and Casey, who you're gonna hear from in a second. And we've created a company called Soil Matters. And I'm based out of Oregon, the central coast of Oregon. Hi, 
Hi. <laughs> uh, Carlo Portugal. I'm an instructor and a researcher at Dr. Elaine Soil for the Web School. It's a pleasure to interact with a lot of you and I see familiar names. So welcome and have a great webinar, everyone. Hi, I'm Keisha Ernst. This is Casey, my husband. We own a biologically focused compost company called uh, Catalyst Bio Amendments. And then we're also soil food web consultants. Um, and we work with Brian Begg. <laughs> and Adam, you might be on mute. Oh, I think I, I, I was pausing for to hear Casey's voice, but maybe oh. he's not. <laughs> Uh, we just we we'll like I like Keisha take it away. It's fine. <laughs> gotcha, gotcha. Okay, so um, my name is Adam Cobb. I'm your host today. Uh, I do content creation and and general science communication here at the school. Um, so I get to to touch a lot of the different programs and and things that we do, including webinars, which is really fun for me. I'm uh, currently in the Boise, Idaho area, uh, and um, I'm really excited to be here and, and learn from everybody today. So we're gonna, without much further ado, flip over to the, to the beginning of this presentation. So I'd like to actually, you know, uh, just kick it off here, introduce, um, you know, Jen and the Sonoterra Farms with just kind of a funny story. And it really this is how Jen and I actually met and this kind of just speaks to, you know, how in life cer certain things are kismet. You just meet the right people at the right time frame and it works. So uh, my wife and I, uh, we are really farmer's market junkies. Uh, I can't tell you how much, if we travel, we're always looking, where's the farmer's market? Uh, schedule our travel around where the farmer's market's going to be. We just absolutely love going to farmer's markets. And this farmer's market uh, that has Jen sign is actually where we used to live in California. This is out of Auburn, California. This is the Auburn farmer's market. And we would, you know, diehards go every single week. And um, we noticed that there was a new vendor that showed up and this was, you know, Jen's booth that she had, had propped up. And so we were very curious to, to talk to the new farmers that, that show up in, in, into the market and just try their produce, talk about how they farm and just, you know, just be sociable and, and chat them up. And so we went over to Jen's booth and I think Jen's mom was working uh, with her that day. And we were talking with Jen and her mom about, you know, how you guys grow and good to see you in the market and looking at the different, you know, produce she was providing and uh, mentioned, you know, what we do, soil biology and all that kind of stuff. And uh, we left uh, our business card uh, with, I think it was Jen's mom. And, you know, that was it as far as the conversation. And it was probably a couple of weeks later, I got a call from Jen that said, hey, you know what? It was interesting, good meeting you at the farmer's market. And I wanna learn more or, or you know, figure out what you do, you know, as far as uh, soil biology and those types of things and soil health. And there we go. That's actually how Jen and I met and, and continued to uh, working together. So, so Jen, I, with that story, I'd just like to, to hand it over to you and, and have you uh, talk about your farm. Sure, thanks, Brian. Uh, yeah, so, um... I own and operate Sonaterra Farm. It is a very small farm. We farm on about a quarter of an acre, actually. And uh, we're in Northern California in the foothills. And um, if you want to go to the next slide, um, I'll just talk a little bit about um, my background. Um, so I grew up on a three-acre homestead in Northern California, um, my parents were huge gardeners. I mean, they would do this massive garden every year where they would take over like a half an acre of their property and <clears throat> they would grow tomatoes and melons and peppers and everything and open it up to neighbors in the area. And sometimes they would sell on the weekends. Um, my mom raised her own beef. We did rabbits and chickens and we processed our own meat. And so I had instilled in me very early on this appreciation of the natural world and just growing everything for yourself and you know access to just all this land and running around. Um, somehow I ended up becoming a computer scientist and I spent uh, about 10 years living and working in the Bay Area at a national laboratory doing software development. And I found after a little while that I just was completely getting burnt out sitting behind my desk and doing all of this 
thinky, thinky work and being just further removed from, from nature. And so I ended up recareering uh, in my late 30s and going back to school and just started taking classes that were interesting to me and more in line with my values. And I found myself really getting into landscape design and architecture, studying permaculture. Uh, I did take a soil science course, um, a bunch of plant ID classes and ended up starting my own landscape design business. And I did that for several years. And then life events kind of happened and I ended up being able to move back to Northern California and the foothills where I, where I grew up. And I love doing landscape design, but I felt like I was still moved far away from having my hands in the soil and being able to grow. So I decided that I was gonna start a farm. And um, you can skip to the next slide. And when I found this property, um, it's about six acres in Newcastle, I just fell in love with it. Um, I, it's bordered by two creeks. It has irrigation water, which is NID, the Nevada Irrigation District in our area. So we have ag water for the site. And it was on a south facing slope that, um, you know, overlooked like these beautiful oak woodlands. And um, I realized that I just wanted to go ahead and farm that pasture that was pretty much pristine. Um, the land itself had, I think horses running on it before the previous owner had said, but it was, it was really lush vegetation. It was covered with a lot of good weeds and I could stick a, a shovel in the soil and it didn't like, you know, jump back at me like what I'm used to in the Bay Area with these intense clay soils that you can't even penetrate. So I wasn't inclined to really do any kind of major modification to the site. It does slope and that presents its own challenges, but it also helps with drainage and it really gives good sun exposure in the winter time. And I warm up really well on this slope. Um, so I wasn't gonna get into terracing. I didn't wanna do a bunch of cut and fill to level everything out. And I didn't feel the need to till the ground either. Um, my soil was, was, I thought really good. It's a, and um, what I did was I just went ahead and took a shovel and made my pathways scraped off the topsoil and shoveled it onto the bed below and then put down a bunch of compost. I did tarp everything for about 10 months, I think, because I had a lot of star thistle and that just completely, you know, demolished it and took care of everything. And yeah, after that kind of treatment, um, I was pretty much up and running. Um, so the next slide. Um, yeah, so that's the little picture of the, what the farm looked like, um, I think about two years ago. It's expanded a little bit since then. I keep opening up beds down the hill and now I'm in full production mode. Um, but what we do um, at Sonaterra is it is a it is a micro farm. And the idea behind that is that you are cramming whole, you know, ton of plants into a very small area. And it's kind of like desktop farming, if you will. Um, you're getting everything into a small footprint so that it's easier for one person to manage rather than have everything spread out over like an acre or two um, where you've got to walk back and forth. You, you know, you've got to use tractors to move everything. The idea is jam as much as you can in a small footprint so that, you know, it can be managed by human scale work. Um, the tools that I use are a broad fork to loosen up compaction. I use a hand reader. Um, I'm not doing anything that is really motorized or, or mechanical. Um, I use all natural methods. I have never really gotten into spraying anything. I have no interest in growing that way. Um, I'd much rather see things kind of taken over by natural processes than I would have to worry about spraying something, whether it's organic or otherwise, that's just not something Thing that I've ever gotten into. I farm about 50 feet from my home well, and I have a lot of wildlife around me. And so I've always been into trying to preserve that. Um, we also run a 26 week season. So um, it's, it's fairly long, I think, but I definitely take time off in the winter months. Um, the ground kind of just rests then, and I don't really want to be out farming anyway in the winter time and mucking around in wet soil. So um, my season runs from April until um, it's usually the beginning of October. Um, the next slide, please. Yeah, so um, I've I met Brian two years after I'd been farming and, and by the time I met him, I really did need him. But um, what I was doing, you know, really kind of aligns with a lot of how he looks at things in the soil. I was seeing stuff happen above ground that I was really excited about. Um, you know, 
uh, because I don't spray or do anything like that, I was able to monitor my crops early on and sort of see what was happening. And I grow a lot of lettuce and I grow it under shade cloth and a misting system to keep it cool in the summertime so that we get a good crop. And I was noticing, oh, I'm putting down all this moisture now and slugs started to move in and earwigs were kind of like living under the lettuce. And before I knew it, I had, a, you know, just this crazy population of tree frogs moving in, living in the lettuce and eating out all of these bugs and it was fantastic. I'd harvest lettuce and bring it up to the wash station and I'd always have one or two tree frogs in the bin. And I started seeing more spiders come up. Not only did I have orb weavers building nests in some of the more perennial style crops, uh, taking out some of the leaf hoppers that would fly in, but I'd have a lot of wolf spiders and ground spiders that would scurry under, you know, the compost or whatever, and they would start, you know, eating other like ground bugs and debris. And ladybugs, I have a ton of those in my surrounding area with, you know, I have honeysuckle, native honeysuckles and lupins and, and they're in there eating all of the aphids. And so my ideology of the farm was to, you know, really capture that, um, help enforce it and do what I can to keep that going. Um, I wanted to always kind of go after this closed system approach, which I think it's a little bit more theoretical than practical, but um, I, you can get really close. And that idea is that everything that goes into the farm um, comes from the farm itself. So you put the plants in, the plants you know, end up becoming compost and they go back into the ground and to really try to minimize any kind of inputs that are coming from outside the farm. Um, you know, I'd looked at going into chickens and, and doing that kind of a thing to have this manure source. Um, so. I haven't quite hit that yet. I get closer every year, but that is sort of what I'm always striving for. But one of the difficulties that I had, I mean, I was getting good production. It was, I would say it was doing really okay, but I had always had trouble with getting, um, you know, kind of like record breaking crops and fertilization was an issue for me. I would plant my plants in my soil that I had amended with compost that I purchased. Um, and I'd see really good production in the beginning and then it would just sort of taper off. And, you know, I'd be reading all these farm books and, and talking to farmers and it's like, oh, you got to top dress. And so it's like, well, top dress with what, you know, and, and, and how and how much and how do I do this? And it was just a real big hassle. Um, I would take these soil tests and I would read them and, and I knew what to do, you know, apply nitrogen, apply phosphorus, apply magnesium. If you're seeing this, oh, I've got blossom end rod. I should look into getting some calcium. Um, and I just felt it was complicated. I wasn't, I was always worried, am I getting it right? Am I doing this right? And um, when Brian came to the farmer's market, it was, it was love at first word. I was just so excited to, to meet him. And I will hand it over to him because he's going to talk a little bit about what he noticed when we started working together and some of the approaches that he helped guide me with. Yeah, thanks, Jen. You know, it's it's exciting to have a client like Jen, uh, where I mean, her mindset and ideology and her approach to farming is already well down the road of, you know, embracing a lot of the soul food web techniques. You know, I think when I went to the farm, I was already impressed with you know the production of the plants. Everything was looking pretty healthy, and I was just noticing there's some just tuning and tweaking that we need to do to be able to really, I think, you know, get that soil biology optimal and really kind of focus on some soil health kind of uh, activities. And so, you know, when I did the first visit and, and talked with Jen kind of about her goals and her approach to farming, I was like, okay, this is going to be great. I think this is going to be um, an easy transition. You know, there's other clients I have that are way down the whole conventional road and they've been doing it for, you know, either generations where the land is really, really in poor, poor condition. Um, and that wasn't necessarily the case here. Um, you know, so I think you know, with Jen's stewardship of the land and kind of her, you know, philosophy, uh, it was like, yeah, we, we can really make a jump on this really quick and make some, some pretty good turnarounds, um, you know, with that. And it's great, you know, like Jen said, it, it's this ecosystem that she, she was building, you know, in her environment. And it was evident when I first went there, I was like, yeah, I, this is great. I, I see the beginnings of, of some really, really strong, um, you know, farming practices that, that uh, we can really kind of work with. So, yeah, it, I would just have to say that um, her ideology and her, her approach to farming is just a really good fit. All right, Jen, uh, take it away. Um, okay, um, if you want to go to the next slide, um, 
Brian, do you want to talk about this or do you want me to take it? Um, why, don't you, why don't you start with with kind of your experiences and then, and then I'll, I'll uh, okay. follow up behind you. And then you jump in. Yeah. Okay, so um, one of the first things that Brian um, did when he came out to my farm was he took a look at my soil and he uh, was at the pentrometer, right? That goes in. We did compaction testing, exactly. Yeah, um, compaction testing. And I always thought, oh, I've got good soil because I'm used to basically working in concrete in all the previous gardens I had in the Bay Area with the clay. So to me, the fact that I could get anything in there, um, you know, it was like, wow, this is really good. But he was like, no, 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 you can do better than this. <laughs> and, um, you know, we were taking a look at everything and um, he did look at my soil under the microscope and found that um, I really didn't have any life in there. I think you maybe found like one or two bacteria or something like that, but yeah, no yeah. fungi, no nematodes. I had, I had like nothing. It was pretty much devoid of life, right? Yeah, it was, it was a bacterially dominant soil. So bacteria is the predominant organism there. And, um, you know, little to no fungi, again, no of the you know, protozoa, the predators and, the, you know, the nematodes were, were absent from that. The condition of the soil looked okay and the compaction was, you know, not horrible, but not great. So, you know, when looking at that, I was like, oh yeah, we, we got some, definitely some room for improvement here. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, he crushed my hopes and dreams and then built the back up. <laughs> so, uh, uh, he, um, he got me going with making compost and that was really actually really fun and probably uh, well, the most impactful thing that I've done. So um, highly recommend looking at how to make good compost. Um, I had made it once before and had gotten really lucky by taking a lawnmower and mowing over my lawn at um, my previous home I owned. And I had sucked up a bunch of grass clippings and a bunch of leaves and left it in a pile. And I really got lucky. And I thought, oh, this is so easy to do. Anybody can make compost. Um, and then when I tried to make it again, um, it just completely failed. And um, having his method and having him walk me through that and show me everything has been um, just so instrumental in getting it right. And as having him as a mentor means that if something does start to go wrong, like it starts to smell off or it's not heating up or, um, you know, something's just not right about the pile, insects are moving, I can just text him and he's like, oh yeah, I just do this. And so he saved me from, I think a couple batches now that have been kind of off, but um, the general process that they use, which I think is, is pretty straightforward, um, you get a bunch of browns and you get a bunch of greens and you measure it into buckets. It's, it's foolproof, um, aside from having to just make sure that your greens are of this certain um, nitrogen amount and that your browns are you know, suitable for composting. So I myself have access to a lot of tree, trip, tree chips from a local tree trimming company. And so they dump all this stuff on my property and that's what he recommended using. And we waited and used one of the piles that I think had sat there for about a year so that it wasn't like, you know, super raw wood. Uh, it had aged down a little bit and um, mixed it with a bunch of greens. And um, I think our first batch of compost was like high nitrogen used um, corn. And so mm -hmm. we built this pile together. And these pictures aren't exactly showing this. This is like another batch that I made later on, but still same process, soaking the wood chips, getting them really wet with water for 24 hours. And then I like to use a lawnmower on my greens. This is showing, um, some of my tomato plants that I had um, pulled at the end of the season that I'm mowing over and it chops it up and collects it in the bag and then I can dump it into a bucket to measure out the greens. And then on the right, that's some high nitrogen. It's chopped up pea plants and bean plants and some of my chicken manure that I have. Uh, and Jen, I just like to mention, I love the the um, the lawnmower. You know, this is the ingenuity of farmers, which is like, all right, I've got all these long, stringy plants, and I, I think we had talked about, you know, some of the experiences I had where I took some rye one time that was, you know, eight foot tall, put them in my compost pile, and it became just locked in spaghetti mess, and it was just <laughs> yeah. hard to do. And Jen's like, well, God, I got to figure it out. <laughs> I'll just use my lawnmower and I'll chop it all up. And I just love that ingenuity. It was like, okay, got a problem which the tools I have and then figure out how to use those tools to make your life easy. So kudos to you, Jen. <laughs> Thanks. 
Uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, it shows uh, what the compost looks like after you mix it up together. And so um, you measure out all of these ingredients. I think it's 24 brown, 12 green, and then four high nitrogen. And um, I build the pile as I mix these together into a smaller ratio. And so I turn all of that together. And then um, this is me just using a bucket. Um, Brian recommended this because you know sometimes shoveling and like lifting it up into the wire cage can get really um, heavy and awkward when you've got like a heavy weight on the end of a shovel stick. And so I scoop it into buckets and then toss it into this cage. And then in, from there, you're just really just monitoring the temperature and the water and looking at that kind of information, making sure it has moisture and it's sat at a certain time, then you go ahead and turn it. And um, they have a really great process for turning it so that you're always kind of getting the outside to the inside and the top is moving around and that core of the compost pile really heats up the most, the fastest. And so it's making sure that everything has a chance to get into the center of that pile where it's really the most active and you're breaking down all the bad organisms and breaking down everything into um, you know, good compost. So um, this process is a bit of work, um, you know, hand turning the pile, um, but you learn a lot from doing it. And um, we looked at it under a microscope. Um, he came out and um, it, it was amazing what was in there. I mean, it's, you think about pond water under a microscope and then you see it in the soil and it's like, oh my gosh. I mean, we had everything. Do you want to talk about what we saw? Yeah, for sure. So the compost came out really good. We, we had, um, you know, the right sets of bacteria. Jen did a very good job of following the practices as far as taking temperature, checking moisture and keeping a log and then determining, okay, we meet certain conditions. Now it's time to turn. And so she really kept up well with that. And, and that's always kind of the key to success is, you know, making sure that you're kind of following what the, the pile is telling you. Do I have enough moisture? Do I have the right temperature for, for you know, for how long? And yeah, we had... Uh, great bacteria, really good fungi uh, growing in the pile, and then a lot of predators. We had the protozoa, flagellates, and amoeba. We had a lot of good bacterial feeding nematodes that were in the pile. Yeah, and, and I, none I, of this was in my soil before. And, correct. And, and it's like, here we are making it. And even though I'm putting down compost that I would purchase, you think it should be in there. We'll talk about that more later, but... I had none of this in my soil at all. And here it is like just in just massive quantities, all of these guys. Um, yeah. It's really fascinating. It, you know, it was it was great. We had the, you know conversation early on when we first did the assessment and said, hey, you know, the way we're really going to to make the change into your soils is we've got to get the biology in there, and our primary tool is going to be compost. And there's really two ways about this. You either going to purchase compost from somebody who's making good biological compost, like what Keisha and Casey do or you're going to make it on site. And, you know, there's a thing about, you know, on-farm compost that I really like, which is as you start to, you know, build compost piles, you're pulling materials that have already got access to a lot of those organisms, and you're now kind of tailoring your compost to the microorganisms that really fit for your, your crops and your property. And uh, Jen was really committed from the get-go, saying, you know what, that's what I want to do. You know, I've got all these residues, um, let's go ahead and make, um, you know, compost here on site. And Jen, just quick question. How many compost piles have you done now? Do, roughly? Do you remember off the top of your head? Mm, I did three the first year and then I've done three now and I'm going to try to do another five. Exactly. Uh, before, yeah. During, in the spring for this year. So, and another question for you. So now that you've got, I'll say six piles under your belt, and this is something I always, you know, intrigued to find out from my clients is, do you feel like you have an intuition of when a pile is working well or when a pile is not working well, you know, like if it's starting to go off or yeah. it, yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, still some surprising things kind of happen. Um, <laughs> but uh, for the most part, yeah, I mean, once I get it going and, and those first two days when you're checking the temperature of it and you kind of see, oh, okay, I, it's, it's hit 165 or something. I, and, and that's, it's like, okay, cool. I know I've hit the max heat and it's just, you know, keep this going and you're, you're monitoring it. But um, yeah, I, just doing it more gives you confidence with what's going to happen and then knowing how to save it if something goes wrong. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but for the most part, yeah, after you've done it several times and you get familiar with the smells of things and how much moisture to add, which is sometimes the struggle, I think, um, you know, just every time you do it, it's just, you pick up more and it makes the next, next batch easier. So, um, yeah, I don't, I don't think I have to call you anymore. 
<laughs> yeah, which is it's just great. It. Like, well, I'm sure. <laughs> well, it, you know, this is always the progression I like with clients. You know, usually your our interactions are intense in, early on. We, you know, when we're starting to develop the practices for your farm and we're doing a lot of that transitional work. And then my hope and goal is that you get to a spot to where you're very resilient, and you know, and you can self-support yourself. And I just come in, you know, in case of emergency, break glass, you know, or or just a check-in to say, hey, look. We've been doing this for a while. Let me go see what's in the soil. And I love that feeling of when clients are, are feel confident and say, yeah, I got this. I can make my own compost. I know how to mulch. I know how to apply compost extracts. And I'm now rocking it with my farm. Um, you know, to me, I think that is the progression that we all hope to see. So um, it, I'm glad that you've gotten to that spot. You know, I, I think Jen's got a lot of confidence now with the soil food web practices. And, and you know, you'll see later on the presentation, you know, it's, it's definitely having an impact to her farm. <laughs> Thanks. Um, yeah, Adam, do you want to go to the next slide? And we'll talk a little bit about how we applied this. So the, the key, of course, is um, making compost, biologically complete compost that is loaded with microbiology that helps you know feed the plants ultimately. So um, it, the way that Brian recommended applying this, um, you know, we talk about compost teas. Um, those I believe are more, you know, geared for plants that um, it's like a foliar feed and if you have like foliage issues, but we just kind of went ahead um, and did soil drenches with compost extract. So um, compost extracts are really easy to make. Once you have your compost, you're just shoveling maybe like a pound of it into a bag and you're washing the microorganisms off with, I believe we used a foggit nozzle, which is like a, sort of uh, medium to high pressure misting nozzle that you just spray on the compost and it, you know, lets all of the liquid and the organisms drain into a bucket. And then from there, you can drench your soil with it. So um, that was what I was applying to my farm. Um, and um, I was doing it on a monthly basis for crops that, um, you know, seemed really healthy. And then if I saw like an issue pop up, which we'll talk about in a minute, um, you know, I was doing it more often, like maybe once a week or every other week. Um, another one of his recommendations was that I mulch my beds. And this is one of the ones that was just so hard for me to do because, um, you know, as a market gardener, we want access to the soil. <laughs> you don't want to cover it up because that just means you have to take it off later when you want to run a cedar or do certain kinds of things. And I had always had in my mind that putting wood chips on the ground would be bad. It would suck out nitrogen. And he assured me, no, if that's been sitting around for a year, that's not going to happen. Um, mulch your beds. <laughs> so I did, I did, um, I did get mulch out there and I was also using, instead of tree chips, a straw mulch that has UV reflectance that helps keep up the crops. Um, they've done some studies with that and um, I tried it out using some tin foil on one and using straw on the other. And I found that it really helped keep aphids off. It confuses them when they're flying around to have this UV light coming at them. At least that's the theory behind it. And they tend not to land on those plants. So, um, and the straw is kind of easier for me uh, to remove than wood chip. So depending on what I'm growing and where, um, you know, I would put down straw or I'd put down wood chips. Um, another strategy, or did you want to say something, Brian? Well, Sorry. yeah, I was just going to say on in in you know when we were talking about mulching, you know, there's there's some challenges too when you're putting down a mulch. Um, you know, if you're going to use straw, what kind of straw are you going to use? And one of the recommendations we made here was to use a rice straw, uh, simply because some of like the wheat straws in this climate you'll get a lot of seed and then all of a sudden you're going to have a lot of wheat growing, you know, in your beds where rice won't easily germinate. And, and if it does, it's, it's very haphazard. And so picking the right mulch is really important. And the other thing too, when we're talking about wood chips as mulch, um, I always have this process that I like to use where if I'm bringing in wood chips, especially from, you know, a crew that goes out and chips trees, sometimes you just don't know what's in there. It could be, you know, cedar and eucalyptus and redwood and these other plants that have a lot of, you know, verminobes, antimicrobial compounds that need to off gas and, and really kind of break down. And so uh, we, Jen had mentioned that what we'll do is we'll, we'll bring chips in and typically quarantine them for six months to a year. And so the chips that, that uh, Jen does use for both the compost as well as mulching have already gone through that that um, off gassing process and become much more of a good fungal food source and don't you know introduce any kind of problems when you just directly apply it on the top of the soil. Yeah, um, that is that is so right. <laughs> um, 
the and then there's the roots, right? So um, that was another thing that um, that I had heard about and I had started doing, but Brian just reinforced it that um, instead of pulling the plant out when you're harvesting and you need to put in another crop, leave as much of the root mass behind as you possibly can. So um, the microbes, you know, interact with the with the roots of the plants, and if you leave the roots in the soil, you know, not only are you kind of like letting that pore space that you've created and build structure in your soil kind of remain intact and decompose slowly and enforce that that structure to continue and get good aeration, but the microbes are living on those roots. And if you pull out the roots, you're pulling out the microbes and you're causing a disturbance to the soil. And it's kind of like everything has to kind of like reassess from that. So, um, you know, it's always do as little damage as you possibly can. And, you know, for me, um, it ended up working just fine. Um, you know, when I'm pulling out a lettuce crop and I'm gonna flip the bed, I just use when I'm harvesting, actually, I just come around and I and I cut off just a little bit below the crown of the lettuce and it never regrows. And then the root mass that's in there, I just use those as markers for when I plant my next crop in. <laughs> so <laughs> I just plant right next to that one. And I, I it worked great for me. I didn't have any issue. My lettuce grew fantastic. Um, I think pretty much everything I was able to leave in the ground except for okra um, and Swiss chard, because those have like sort of these really deep fleshy tubery roots that can kind of re-sprout on me. Um, and so I had, I had great success with that. Uh, yeah. And, I, it, it, and I'm just curious on your experience too. Uh, did you notice how fast the roots break down as far as they didn't really inhibit you in planting besides those two crops that you talked about, right? No, no, they were gone. Uh, I think probably by the, you know, I mean, I'm on a lettuce rotation in the summertime. Um, you know, the plants are in there for four weeks and then I, I have a, a crop. So by the time I planted that bed the second time, um, you know, so it's eight weeks, those roots were gone. Mm -hmm. It's about how long it took. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, do you want to go to the next slide, Adam? Right. So this is talking about the results that I had um, from, from implementing Brian's practices. Um, and what I saw was just phenomenal. I had, I had the best year I've ever had on my farm last year. And, um, you know, I had always had okay production, meaning that, you know, my tomatoes, I thought made a lot of good fruit and then, um, they would produce pretty well, but then they would just kind of like slow down and, um, they would stall out. And then I was always kind of struggling to figure out, well, what do I top dress with? How do I apply this? Maybe I need to get into, um, you know, fertigation so that it, it gets to the roots faster than just doing a top dress and waiting for that to break down. Um, but what I found was I was getting these, um, this magazine quality trusses on my tomatoes that I had never seen before. And they were hanging on there for much longer. Instead of just being on for that first six week push when the tomato is pumping out fruit, I had production that stayed throughout the entire season. Um, you know, my tomatoes start producing sometime around in June and they were going all the way through to the end of August, uh, October, uh, especially on my cherry tomatoes. When I pulled plants out at the end of the season, um, I was tired from picking them. <laughs> I was like throwing these plants, you know, that I knew was going to compost with fruit off into the pile. Um, I just had um, a fantastic tomato year and I have difficulty with, with a virus, which is on the next slide. And I had actually lost um, some of my plants and I was growing like three quarters of what I normally grow plant wise. But um, <laughs> the fascinating thing is that um, I was getting more production than I had the year before with less plants. So um, it, you know, it was just fantastic. My dahlias did extremely well. They produced all year. Um, basil was another one for me. I usually plant that crop and then I harvest it for maybe mm, six weeks and then I'm planting another crop. And it always just kind of wants to go to seed on me and the leaves get kind of tough. But I had basil that was up to my chest. It was four feet tall and I was harvesting that crop all the way up until the end of the season and was off of the first planting. So it just kept growing. I would cut it and it would come back and it never seemed to wanna finish its life cycle. It was just really happy. <laughs> so um, next slide, please. One of the problems that I have on my farm is um, mosaic virus. And um, it showed up the first year I started farming um, 
and it came in on my squash. And if you're not familiar with it, it's really a devastating virus. I, I in particular have cucumber mosaic virus and it's believed to be spread mostly by the aphid rather than the leaf hopper. And what it does is uh, the aphid bites the plant, infects it with this virus, it goes systemic and it causes the plant to you just completely break down. It stops producing fruit. Um, the leaves get distorted and mottled a lot of times with like a yellow mosaic pattern. And um, the fruit almost always becomes unsellable. It gets uh, bumps and splotches and divots and it hardens up and it's just destroyed. And everybody at the agricultural extension office that I talked to or other far is you gotta pull the plants. You gotta destroy the plants. Um, they can't come back from that they are destroyed and they're just keeping this source of inoculum around for aphids to spread to other healthy plants. <clears throat> so the advice was to destroy all the plants. And that had been what I was doing beforehand. Um, it usually came in on my peppers and squash if I saw it and I would take out the plants and destroy them. So um, this year when I was farming, I saw it come in on my tomatoes at first and I was just in this panic mode of like, oh no, you know. Um, but instead of pulling all the plants that had it, I went through and did an initial culling of, um, I think it was probably about 20 or 25 plants that looked pretty heavily infected. And I left the others that looked just sort of so-so and started hitting them with compost extract. Um, I hit them hard, like every week they got this huge soaking of compost extract. And what I found was that the mosaic virus did not spread anywhere else. It did not go into any of my other crops. I had the lowest incidence on my farm that I've ever had. And in that first photo, you can kind of see the telltale signs of mosaic virus on a tomato. And that's the shoestringing appearance of the leaf. And it turns into sort of this like ribbony looking type thing. Um, and the next photo is showing the fruit just above that plant and healthy leaves are coming out of the top of that, which is showing me that, you know, the systemic disease that's supposed to go entirely through this tomato plant is now producing all of this healthy foliage. And it, that shouldn't have happened. It gets mosaic and it just destroys the plant and it's out of there. But the plant recovered and it started producing fruit. And it didn't, you know, this particular plant that I was watching along with a couple others in it, they didn't produce as strongly as my other plants, but they still made good fruit and they did not get any worse the rest of the season. Um, moreover, I didn't have this virus spreading rampant through my farm onto other crops. I left a lot of plants that were infected, probably um, you know, a good 16 or so, rather than pulling them out, just to kind of see. Brian had told me about, um, well, actually, maybe you want to talk about it. Great yeah, blotch, it, right? It, it, it red blotch in, in grapes, you know, so the, the viruses, and this is a discussion that, that Jen and I had. I remember this very distinctly. You know, Jen calls me up and says, hey, I got mosaic virus. I talked to County Extension. This is what they recommend. What do you think? And we talked really about risks, you know, and said, you know, really our goal here by really improving the soil biology is to increase the immune system of plants to, to you know, to make those plants as healthy and vigorous as possible to try to fight these, you know, pretty nasty systemic viruses that can occur. And I, you know, talked about an example of a vineyard that um, I work with that had red blotch, which is, a, you know, a virus in vines. And the, the typical recommendation is to, to pull those vines plus some of the ones that are next to it. And my vineyard client didn't want to do that. And he was, you know, with myself kind of convinced that, you know, if we really try to focus on the health of those plants that have the virus, can we try to mitigate the issues from the virus? And we had great success with that, where, you know, red blotch is not showing up in those plants that were previously infected, or at least not showing the signs of it. And they're being productive. Um, and so we talked about risk and, well, you know what, you've got mosaic virus, it can be a vector to other plants, but we think, you know, we can probably help tamp this down, reverse some of the damage and see if we can keep a healthy crop. And if, if it's not working, then, you know, immediately go ahead and cull those plants. And Jen, you know, really took at it and said, all right, fine, I'm going to put compost extracts, as you said, once per week. Uh, and it was great to converse with her afterwards, you know, or, you know, through the process saying, yeah, it's, it's doing just what she described. It's slowed or mitigated the, the impact of the virus and the plants were being productive. And so we said, all right, fine, that's going to be our practice. You see the mosaic virus. If it's really bad, pop it out. Uh, if it's not, uh, let's go ahead and just really try to focus on the health of that plant and make sure we get, you know, a good functioning soil food web um, in the root zone of that plant to see if we can overcome those diseases. 
And I, I'm, you know, I'm really glad that, that we did. And, and I think, you know, in this case, Jen, it, it helps your farm as far as you still made production off those plants, even though it may have been yeah. the best production, but it's still production. It overall, it was the best year of it. And um, yeah, when it came up, I was, I was devastated in a panic. <laughs> they right. called it. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it, it ended up being absolutely fine. And, and that's a lot of this is that you, you work with what you have and, and it doesn't mean total failure. And um, just to add to that, I do, um, I do plant my plants too early. So I guess I haven't been farming long enough to, to get over that. <laughs> we always want to get our plants in too soon, right? We want to- mm, optimism, optimism, right? You're like, it's going to be one of those yes. warm it's springs cold, and dry. Right? And, <laughs> and this last particular year, um, we had these crazy frosts that came in and I was still um, you know, migrating over to Brian's practices and trying to leave behind what was drilled into my head that you have to add all this compost. you know, And I had over composted my beds and the plants were producing way too much green foliage and they were attracting the aphids and it was cold and they were stressed and they kept getting frosted. Um, so they were under a lot of stress. Um, and, uh, so I did not help them out in any way. <laughs> um, not with that. So uh, the other thing that we noticed too, um, result wise, is that this was the first year, my last year was uh, where I didn't have any blossom and rot. I always get blossom and rot on my tomatoes and I even have it on my peppers. Um, and again, that's probably uh, in part for me planting plants too soon in cold soil. Um, but what it is, it's a calcium deficiency in the plants. Either they can't access it or it's not there. Most likely it's, they just can't access it. Um, and it's hard for them to take up calcium. And so it causes this brown spot on the bottom of the fruit and it's unsellable. And I always end up throwing away like the first crop of my tomatoes to um, to blossom and rot and kept wanting to try to apply cow mag to the soil and do all these things. And I never had good results. So this year I didn't worry about any of that. I just, um, you know, before I planted my seedlings, I would um, dip them into compost tea or compost extract the entire plant. I would submerge it, pour a little bit in the planting hole, and then started on providing all of my plants with a <clears throat> a good soaking of compost extract every month if they were healthy. And I didn't have any signs of it at all. Yeah, I think that's a good point too, Jen, that, um, you know, a lot of focus is, you know, improving all the beds and doing the mulching, that type of thing too. But there's also a real critical part about making sure that you inoculate at planting, either the seeds or the starts um, to make sure that when you get them into those beds, they already have a really good set of microorganisms around the rhizosphere. And yeah, I really think that sets good success. And said it's a great bath. And it is. It's yeah. a great bath. It's like a perfect <laughs> micro bath. Um, yeah. Tramp was yeah. like, yes, perfect spa day. Great. Love it. <laughs> um, okay. Uh, so the next slide, <clears throat> I think this talks about some of the challenges that I had um, kind of migrating over into this biological system from what I had been used to and how I grow. <clears throat> um, yeah. So um we have, I have tools that are near and dear to me that I like to use. And one is the Jang cedar and that plants, um, you know, all of my carrots, um, it does my arugula, it does my radishes, uh, does some lettuce crops. And the way that it works, it needs access to the soil. So when Brian had first said, you got to put all this mulch down, I was so hesitant to do it um, because I want to be able to use these tools. And so the other thing that we do too um, on my farm is we do a lot of intercropping. So not only are you putting like, you know, one crop down, um, but when that uh, has gone like a certain amount of time, then the, the next crop comes in and you're kind of relay cropping and you're always needing access to the soil and putting in plants and taking out plants. And mulch really gets in the way of that. But what I learned from this is that um, leaving that mulch on, I left about half of my beds covered in mulch throughout all of this, this, this year that just came with all these atmospheric rivers we had in California and all this rain. What I found was that all those beds where I left the straw mulch, where I left the wood chips, I had zero compaction in my soil. I usually have to go in broad fork with this big tool to like crack everything open, um, you know, before I'm going to plant any kind of root crop like a beet or a carrot or anything like that and loosen up the soil. But I didn't have to do that. I, I think I told Brian, I said, you know, I dropped my broad fork into the bed and it just sank in 
And I felt like I was causing more compaction with putting the broad fork in than I was by just leaving it alone. Um, I could stick my hand all the way into my soil and get almost up to my elbow. And so I was like, wow, this is amazing. So um, while it is a little bit more work for me moving mulch off to run my cedar and then wait a while and maybe put mulch back on, um, that still only takes me like five minutes with a good rake versus having to broad fork a whole bed, do harder labor, and, you know, um, it takes longer. So um, that has actually um, been a blessing in disguise. Um, the other issues that I ran into just personally were storing the compost. So I try to make a lot of the compost in my downtime, which is you know um, early spring, late fall, when I have access to greens on my property. And um, I like to kind of batch that up um, so that I'm not having to make it when I'm you know in full swing mode, like in July when everything's just going crazy. And I started off storing it um, you know in these big Rubbermaid totes that have pulled 100 gallons and um, sorry about that. <laughs> Darn technology. Um, so I started off storing these Rubbermaid totes and water would get in, it would infiltrate and it would fill up the bin. And then the bottom would become like this mucky mess. And the, you know, I, then I'd be like calling Brian going, how do I save this compost? And, and he's like, what you really need to do is get these macro bins. And so once I got those, it was like, yeah, these are totally worth spending the money on because they hold the compost so well, air is able to get in there. Um, if I do have an event where the rain comes in and the tarp blows off, I don't feel like I have to get up at 4 a.m. and run out there and cover it. It's going to recover. Um, so having just the right type of system set up so that once it's made, um, I know where I'm putting it. It's being stored over there. And everything is just, you know, a lot more efficient for me in that way. And um, while you might think that making compost is, you know, it is a lot of work. It's, it's a lot of work. Um, you have to monitor the pile. Uh, you have to make sure that if it's going to be sitting there throughout the summer, that you are, you know, keeping the moisture intact and you're not letting everything dry out. And I had trouble with that early on until I kind of, you know, got the handle of how much water to put and when. Um, and while that is a lot of work, um, it's still less work, I think, than having to go out and monitor your crops. I would rather monitor, you know, um, two or three micro bins of of microbes, then I would have to go out and check my plants and make sure like, okay, are they showing this deficiency? Are the tomatoes, do they need nitrogen? Do they need phosphorus right now? Am I steering the crop in the right way? Um, you know, am I seeing this pest or this disease? Should I be worrying about this? I'm not having to worry about that stuff anymore. Like, I feel like I can go into this season and not be panicked about mosaic virus. Like, I know what to do. I'm not going to have to go scouting around and see, like, you know, if I've got aphids on the underside of this or that. Um, I just have to monitor these bins. I just have to farm the microbes. And it's such a beautiful way of doing it um, to give the plants access to the type of stuff that it needs, kind of try to provide like this. I like to think of my soil as this four season hotel, you know, make this environment for the microbes to live in and let the plant figure out what it needs when. If it needs calcium, it's going to send out through its little roots or whatever the signals to attract the right microbes that are going to deliver that to it or however that stuff works. You guys know more about that than me. Um, but what it means for me as a farmer is I'm not thinking about anything on that level. I'm working above that. I just tend to these guys and they do all that work for me. So just getting used to this shift of what I used to do, uh, it's kind of like recareering in the farm. I don't have to do certain things that I did before, letting some of those things go and just doing different practices. And I think overall it is at least the same, if not slightly less work for me. Um, so it's been very effective, I think, in that way. Which I, you know, hopefully brings more joy to the farming, right? Oh, for sure. <laughs> for some of the some of the aspects of farming, like weeding and doing broad forking, oh, you know, I, after you, you do a number of beds, you're like, oh my gosh, okay, that's just drudgery, <laughs> and be able to get rid of that, it, you know. And one other thing too, you know, it, this is a conversation that Jen and I had early on, which was, you know, when you're going to follow these practices, you're going to become a microbe farmer. You know, you're going to farm tomatoes and carrots and onions and all these other things, but you're also going to become a microbe farmer. And Jen's really taking that kind of to heart. And you are, you're a microbe farmer. That's, it's another one of your crops that you essentially have uh, by doing your compost and making your extracts and do all those kind of things. I mean, 
it's one of the mindset of saying, you know, the compost is no longer just this innate static thing. It's a living organism that I have to care for. I have to treat right. And if I do so, then I get the returns and rewards from it. Um, so I just love seeing that, that uh, you really kind of in, embody that, uh, that, that mantra that you're a microbe farmer. <laughs> All right, so um, I think this is our last slide. Well, one last thing I'll just say with Jen is um, I'm also glad that you become a, a mulching co convert. <laughs> <laughs> oh, gosh, yeah. You know, that saved me tremendous work. And, uh, you know, the other thing about the mulching that I forgot to mention, um, we had atmospheric rivers this year in California, um, and they were really bad. Like, we had a week, I think, where we had, like, I think it was three in a row or something, and I got, I have a rain gauge, and I had seven and a half inches of rain, um, oh, I think, over a four-day period, um, and I didn't have any washout of my topsoil, and I'm on a slope. Like, it just stayed there. <laughs> like it, it was amazing. And it, normally I do, I see some of that come down and, and what that's telling me is that my soil is really opened up. It's less compacted water is able to infiltrate. Um, the only places where I did have trouble is where I had uh, a lot of gopher holes. Those would fill up with water and open up like this kind of like river. Um, and hopefully it flooded the little furry suckers because I hate those things. But, um, <laughs> but yeah, my, my soil stays in place and I'm on a good, I'd say 12, 12%, 10% slope. Mm -hmm. So, you know, stuff normally does kind of filter off onto the next bed or wash onto a pathway and it didn't happen. So stuff stays in place. Um, so what I've learned from um, working with Brian, um, I think it's, it's been like a whole year now. I think we've gone through a whole year, right? Maybe mm -hmm. a little yeah. bit more? Uh, uh, about yeah, a year so. and a half, but, but really one full season where you started from the fall well, all the way into the next. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, and I still have to, you know, um, do a little bit more work with that. Is you know, it's a process of kind of moving over from your old way of growing into the new system. So, um, but what I've learned, um, one of the big key things for me is that plants don't need to be fed. Um, you know, that's always driven into your brain. You learn about the nutrients that they need with the nitrogen and the phosphorus and the potassium and the calcium and magnesium and all these things. And um, they don't need it. Um, with the microbes, they are able to feed themselves and supply themselves everything that they need from the soil. Um, I still put compost on my beds and I probably don't even need to do that, but I'm using less and less every year. This year, I'm just putting out a half an inch um, because I'm trying to replace what I did take away. And I'm still putting out more than I think I need to. Um, this first picture, it's probably the least attractive picture in my slide deck, but it is the coolest one because what it is showing is a 10 gallon bucket of crushed up tomato plants, an entire row of my tomato plants at the end of the season fit into that bucket there. And I have huge plants. They get 20 feet long and I do kind of do bottom prune, but still all of those 42 plants fit into that bucket. And you can imagine if that were composted, it would break down even further to probably maybe another 30% less in volume. That's how much I'm taking out of my soil. That's what the plants are taking out at most. Um, the fruit that they make, you know, maybe they make um, 20 pounds each, these tomato plants. If you take those tomatoes and dry them out, it's really mostly water. So, I mean, all in all, maybe it's like 10 gallons of, of material that's really kind of coming out of, of my beds. And so that to me is really all I feel I need to put back in organic matter like you know sort of keep that cycle going and and also just provide more um area for the micro to live on um and the other thing that i learned is that composts are not created equal um you know i think everybody's had an experience where you buy compost and if you're if you're a grower or doing a garden and it's just miserable it stinks it's it's rotten it's sludgy or it's got all kinds of plastic and glass broken up in it and you never know what you're getting you can go to the compost facility and you can check it out there and then order it and that may not even be what you get when you see it so um i had always sought out trying to find the best compost possible and um, I just, it always felt like I was playing Russian roulette with it. And I'd order it early to let it sit in a pile so that before I'd have time to decide, okay, am I really gonna put this down on my crops? And um, I knew you could get bad compost. What I didn't know was that how good compost can be when you make it yourself and properly. Um, you know, we've looked at my compost under the microscope and we've looked at my soil that has had all of the previous compost applied to it in the year before. I had no life. 
And then Brian and I looked at my soil after I applied the extracts and, you know, the compost in the, that I put in the plants and started everything with to having all of this life. So if you make it yourself or you buy really good compost, like from Keisha and Casey, they're <laughs> the only people I know that do this um, and make it the right way. It, it's just a completely other animal from what you can buy. It's, it's almost like I wouldn't even think about it as applying compost unless you get lucky. Um, I just think of it as applying organic matter when I apply it. And hopefully it's, you know, it's aged enough to where, you know, okay, I'm not putting down something anaerobic or overly salty that's going to harm the microbes, but I'm putting in an organic matter. Um, and now I'm going to apply my life <laughs> with my compost extract. And, you know, hopefully I'm able to make um, all my compost. Um, if you want to go to the next slide. Well, actually, Jenna, I want to add oh, something here real quick before you jump over there. I, I love the aha moments, right? And these are the times when you make a realization and it's very impactful. And the picture you have on the left there is that kind of aha moment for you, which was, you know, you grow these big plants. They're, you know, like you said, 20 foot tall. And you look at them and you're like, wow, that's a lot of space. But when it really comes down to it, it's a lot of water and it's a lot of just, you know, space that's in there. And it's not necessarily a lot of material. And the aha moment you pulled from this was really at the end of the day, my plants are not pulling that much out of the soil. And when you look at, because this is a question we always get, which is, you know, you're going to exhaust your soils really quick. You're going to, you know, remove the nutrients, um, you know, in a farming practice. Therefore, you have to add nutrients, you know, back in in these, these large quantities. The reality is that th there's a vast amount of nutrients that are locked into the mineral and exchangeable pools in the soil. And it's the biology that's going to unlock those nutrients for you. And so, you know, the fear that a lot of people get around, I'm going to exhaust my soils really, really quick. It, it's just one of those things that, doesn't quite hold water because, you know, your aha moment here kind of really illustrates that very, very well. So I, I'm glad you were able to kind of, you know, you know, make that aha moment for yourself. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the next slide is just sort of talking about, um, if you want to jump to the next one, um, it's talking about, um, you know, where we're headed um, with this and, and what my goals are moving forward with, um, these new methods. And of course I want to make more compost. I'd love to supply all the compost for my farm. Um, and I think that that's fully achievable as I learn more and more how little I really have to apply of the good stuff. Um, you don't need a lot and it's certainly conceivable for me to be able to hand turn, um, you know, and make these curated piles. Um, I think I'd probably need to do it maybe 12 times. Um, but, then I'd have everything, right? Uh, and, and really good stuff. And so that's where I'm headed, um, being able to do that and continue working on closing my system at the farm. Um, you know, I'll always have to be purchasing seeds because I'm not going to get into saving all my seeds and some of the hybrids I grow, it's just not feasible to do that and try to grow all that out. But, um, you know, making my own compost um, on site, I don't, I don't have a lot of browns. Um, uh, you know, I don't have a lot of um, deciduous trees. Um, and so what I tend to do is bring in my wood chips. They're free from a local tree trimmer. And I'm okay with that because um, while I'm increasing my carbon footprint, I suppose, I'm reducing, I'm reducing his. He's um, able to drop to me like these loads that normally have to truck out like 20 miles or something to get rid of. And so they're coming and um, overall, I think that that is a very positive, impactful thing. Um, and I have access to them and they're free, so why not? <laughs> um, the other thing I like to buy and purchase is, is rice straw, is hay. I buy about eight bales, um, bought eight bales last year. And that is to help kind of reflect um, the aphids, like I talked about with the UV light off of some crops and to provide a lighter weight mulch for me to easily peel off when I want to go ahead and like run my cedar or interplant into that. The tree chips as mulch on my beds work totally fine. I didn't have any issues with that at all. I was happy with it, but I like to use those for um, crops and beds that are, I'm not going to be, um, you know, running the cedar on or intercropping with that year. So um, that's really where we're headed is just um, more compost, um, Getting into greater efficiency, maybe with making it, um, maybe, you know, if I am producing it um, in larger quantities, maybe looking at doing more of tractor work with that. 
Um, but I know Brian has, you know, suggested that you really have to turn it right and get that going right. And so, um, but I do think there's, there's ways to maybe improve the process somewhat. Maybe I don't make quite as great compost, but it's pretty darn good and I can make it really easy. And then, you know, have some hand curated piles off to the side that I use for teas or extracts if I need them. Um, the other thought was working into cover cropping and, um, you know, I've, I don't think I'll ever be able to do perennial cover cropping just because I am an annual plant farmer. Um, that, uh, you know, everybody I think has these ideals that you can grow these cover crops in there to keep living roots in the soil that are always permanently there. But um, that'll be a hard one for me to not worry about because it's direct root competition with the crop you want to grow. And there's a reason why we pull weeds, right? We don't want them there. We want the plant to be thriving. We want it to be getting the nutrients and it to be getting the water and it to be doing all that stuff. And the focus of the microbes on those roots, not on perennial roots. So we grow those plants, we pull those plants out, we're causing this disturbance. And I think having a perennial crop there would be very complicated. Not to say that it can't be done or there's the right cover crop. Um, I would love to get into that. But my focus, I think, is just more on growing um, a seasonal cover crop and keeping the roots in the soil for microbes to continue to grow and thrive during that period, um, providing a living mulch up above so when the rain comes, it's not as compacted, and then reducing my need for compost and a nitrogen a kind of reboost or whatever that the plant's pulling out would be handled by that cover crop that I would terminate in the spring before I plant. And um, I just haven't really gotten there because it's like, oh my gosh, I'm going to grow another thing in the bed. That it's like another bed flip early on in the season. Um, but I do want to try it. I want to try doing that because I think it will lessen the amount of compost that I have to make. And um, it will probably make things just overall a little bit less work for me. You know, we're always striving for efficiency in the farm because um, that's really how you become profitable. <laughs> you know, you well, have you're to a woman show too i mean you're you're running this farm by yourself uh, which is impressive by the way because it you know you've got quite a bit of produce and you know these are things we've talked about efficiency 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 you know it's the make or break for any kind of market garden and i love how you're incorporating that and figure out oh i want to add these new practices is it efficient or how do i make it efficient right absolutely um yeah so that's all i have if you want to take it back over brian or yeah, just in, in closing, you know, I, I think this is a, one of the reasons why I asked Jen to, you know, to to talk about this is that, you know, she had the right mindset. She went into it and really saw significant changes in just one season of being able to apply this. And and you can see from, you know, what she was talking about, this is just kind of also the beginning of her journey, you know, into doing these soul food practices. I mean, and, and my goal hopefully is, you know, the interaction that I have with Jen, which is set you with the foundational knowledge that you need so that you can start to make a lot of your own decisions um, and say, you know, is this going to be beneficial to the soil biology or harmful if I want to introduce something? And you kind of already have those skills now to be able to to make some of those determinations. Um, so I think, Jen, you're, you're well on your way. And um, I'm excited to see that your farm's doing so good. Thanks. All right, Adam, we're going to hand this back over to you. Perfect. And that was great timing. We're in wonderful... <laughs> situation here and so many great subjects came up um so i want to mention our um the quick video that we're about to show a five minute video that talks about our current um promotional offer this is one of the um like centers of gravity behind these january promotional webinars is that we're letting people know and in particular know that this is the final time that you can get these courses through the Soul Food Web at this 45% off um, discount. So it's a great time if, if people um, are, are on the fence about it to go ahead and jump in there. So let's listen to the video. When we're talking about the soil, we're talking about the basic thing. Even our health depends on the health of the soil. All the sickness and disease leads back to where you live, how you live, and, and what you eat. People don't want to use the chemicals, but they don't have any other way. It's not a desire problem, it's a knowledge problem. Everyone needs to have some awareness of what our Earth is experiencing right now and how we can make a big change. I find that this information hasn't been taught to me and I have to get off my high horse. And even I Adam, can we pause the video right there? Sorry, there's an audio problem. I think Alex is trying to work on it. Sure thing. 
Adam, did you optimize for sound for video when you reshared when you lost it earlier? I think so, but I will try again. Oh, see, it reset. Hmm. I don't know what happened there with that technical glitch. Sorry. Let's see if this is better. Like I'm learning more with this program than I have with in-person classes in the past. I've taken classes on microbiology before, but this course really makes a difference in the way that a story is put together that unveils the relationships between plants and all those beneficial organisms that we just cannot see without a microscope. If you're looking for something that does a deep dive into soil biology, this is it. It is just an incredible knowledge base and is really relevant to what's going on right now in the world. Without it, the only way I could have gained this knowledge would have been by dropping my life and going to graduate school. And that just wasn't realistic for me. But Soil Food Web has made it possible for me to build a meaningful career in land restoration. I was really nervous that I was going to put quite a bit of money down and not get that bang for my buck. But once I actually got into the FC courses, I was incredibly impressed with how professional they are and actually the level of education you receive. This is the career path I've been looking for in the biological community and I was having trouble finding. Buen dia. Salam. Ciao. Bula. Wagwan. Bonjour. Merhaba. Kamarjopa. What if this? Kia ora. It's absolutely amazing to me that there's people with their same approach to life wanting to do better things all over the world. What the course is doing is actually getting those people together. We don't have enough. In terms of the connection to the network, I have found just an environment of camaraderie and cooperation. They want you to succeed and they bend over backwards to give you all of the resources to have you succeed. At the Soil Food Web School, we train farming professionals and ordinary people who are passionate about the environment. Our students are able to help make a real change to the way that food is grown in their communities and to how the earth is being treated. If you're interested in joining the soil revolution, this is a great time. We are making the consultant Kickstarter bundle available for the final time at the price of $38.70. With the consultant Kickstarter bundle, you can register for the Soil Food Web Foundation courses with Dr. Elaine Ingham for just $38.70, saving over $1,100 through January 26. You'll also get stage one of the consultant training program totally free, saving a further $15.40. That's 26 hours of mentor time dedicated to helping you make your own biological compost and develop your microscopy skills to the standard required to qualify as a certified soil food web lab technician. You'll also get two free bonuses with this offer, the Introduction to Permaculture course by Graham Bell and the Soil Sponge Regeneration Workshop with Dee Dee Pursehouse, saving a further $500. The total value of this bundle is over $7,000, for which you'll only pay $38.70, saving you over $3,100. That's 45% off. Remember, this is the final time that the Consultant Kickstarter bundle will be made available at this price, and there are limited places available, so please don't delay. Finance options are now available, so you can pay at your own pace with a firm. Register today. You're muted, Adam. Sorry. I'm going to stop sharing for just a moment and load up the questions that have come in on our Q&A. All right. Does everybody see the first question? Yes. OK. So Nicole asks about a family farm in Eastern Ontario, close to Montreal. It's really expensive to bring in compost to no-till. We're making compost, but it's a slow process. Any suggestions? And I think this is a, you know, you guys have, have teed us up right here with some of your composting uh, background. I did see a lot of questions in chat too, Brian, about mm -hmm. like, the right mixes of different materials for compost and other things. There was a question about using horse manure. So 
yeah, like, would you would you start us off and then we'll add to that? And I think we'll get Casey and Keisha in here too. For sure, exactly, the compost <laughs> experts, right? Um, you know, my opinion on this is, you know, yes, you can make compost and it doesn't have to be a slow process. In fact, if you're really making a good thermophilic compost where you have, and it's really around the recipe, you know, Jen mentioned about the browns and the greens, and the high nitrogens, you know, it, we really were trying to make sure that we have the right mix of materials that are going to, one, really get the biology to start to grow, and then two, sustain that growth over the long haul where we're actually going through that composting process. So getting your recipe done right is great. But you can make really good compost in 28 days. And that's, you know, that's a pretty fast process. And there's a lot of composters that, you know, I've worked with and Keisha and Casey worked with, you know, these very large industrial scale composters. They sometimes will, will keep their compost in the composting process for six months, eight months. And that's just because the, the, the techniques that they're using aren't quite right as far as to really, you know, drive that composting process. So, yes, you can make it in a pretty quick fashion. Um, so... Keisha and Casey, I, you definitely are the composting expert, so I, I say take it away. Yeah, I guess, you know, like you were mentioning with recipe, it, it's very important recipe and knowing your materials because, you know, not all manures are created equal. Not all green materials have as much energy as other green materials. So really getting to understand your materials will really help you dial in your recipes. I mean, the general rule is 60-20-20, right? 60 green or 60 brown, 20 green, 20 high nitrogen. So if inside of that window, weather can play a huge part, right? If it's freezing outside, you might have to raise one category and drop another. So, you know, a lot of it really depends on your starting materials and your environment that you're in. And yeah, like Brian said, with thermophilic composting, yeah, you can have compost pretty quickly in the terms of the composting world, especially versus like a static pile or even worms. It can be faster than both of those two methodologies. You know, I would also say, Nicole, like, uh, you know, the compost that you have access to, um, there in Montreal, it might not be the best compost anyway. Uh, I mean, I, that was brought up over and over again in the previous presentation is, you know, so often we spend quite a bit of money trucking in cheap, uh, cheap compared to our compost, cheap compost, inexpensive compost, but the trucking alone is just insane. I mean, I know from selling our compost sometimes uh, that, you know, we have very expensive product and often the trucking will be um, the same price or more <laughs> to ship. <laughs> So it's never, uh, it's always expensive. Um, and I will also say like, there's not a lot of producers in Canada that we know of that are biologically focused. So, you know, this could be a great, uh, you know, little niche for you to get started. Start with your own farm and maybe other people in your community would be happy to support your endeavors and, you know, give you some money for some of that extra compost you have. I know if I need to find compost in Canada, I have to call so a food web consultants, and typically they're selling from their um, at home piles, which, um, you know, making a hand turn pile isn't easy. So um, it would be good to have some more people at scale up in Canada making decent compost, farm scale compost. Uh, if I can jump in just to complement, like uh, what Casey said, is a very steep learning curve from the beginning. So don't feel... Uh, alone on this journey, all of us who pass through that stage, you need to really know your material and adjust the recipe depending on the time of the year. So keep going, you're going to find your niche, your starting material, and then from that on, you can always repeat the same recipe over and over. Yeah, the, you know, uh, Carly, you mentioned a thing about you know, it, it's difficult to learn at first. And once you get the processes down, and, and this is something that Jen and I were having a conversation about, was the intuition that you, you get from this. It's pretty soon the smell, the feel, the look, all those little signals in your brain are like, yeah, something's not going right. I need to really evaluate what's going on. Or no, this compost is right on track, right on schedule. And, and pretty soon you start to build this really deep intuition in the composting process. And it becomes much, much easier um, after that, that point. Yeah, if, did, Jen, did, did you have anything to say or would you like me to, I, I can move us on here. Oh, well, I could summarize a little bit too. Oh, I think you're muted. No, I think they summarized it pretty well. Um, but yeah, the, the material thing, um, that, that's definitely key. Um, every time I make a pile, I have slightly different materials. And I think that that is, um, 
and that is one of the one of the challenges, right? I've you know got um, greens that I'm harvesting in the spring, or um, maybe I'm grinding up for my greens, um, like you saw with the lawnmower. Um, and I had called Brian because I had trouble with the pile heating up, and he's like, "Wait, you're not counting out, you know, counting for all of the woody material that's in those tomato stalks." Because um, I was thinking of that as a as a green, because the stock was green, and I don't know, it's a soft herbaceous plant kind of, but no, it's woody material, and so there was a nitrogen drop there and so um yeah and the, and just the more you do it and um you know the more that you can have consistent inputs um or at least just know them really well that i'm um, doing this this and this it's like a specific recipe that just streamlines it for yourself so that you just don't have that issue um but even if you screw up you're <laughs> you're making compost. <laughs> so, um, you know, and maybe it's not the best batch. You know, I had a batch that I didn't think I got all the number of turns out of, and it's like, well, okay, so the weed seeds aren't dead. Well, I'm just not going to put that one down on the ground. I'll do this with it or whatever. Um, so even if you fail, you're still producing organic matter that can be used unless you really, you know, have an issue. Uh, but yeah. Um, it, it, go ahead. Right. Oh, all right. The one thing I was just going to mention is that, um, you know, Jen kind of keyed onto another thing too, is starting to know your materials and some materials during the, depending on when you harvest it can be different as well. You know, if you harvested a corn stalk early in its growing cycle, it's going to be much more of a green material leaning towards a high nitrogen. If you ended up harvesting a corn stalk at the very end of its life cycle, it's going to be a lot of woody material with a little bit of green. And so getting familiarity with the life cycle of the materials that you're using is also, and it's a, you know, the way we kind of approach it is we write down our recipes, we take these logs, and then we troubleshoot backwards. We take a backwards look and say, you know what, I think that corn stalk, when I had it, I, I should have had it as more of a woody material and then in green material versus all green. Mm -hmm. And so the next time you know, I'm in that situation, I'll remember, okay, I need to account for the woodiness of that stock. And you start to gain that experience, that knowledge. Yeah, I guess I was just going to add as I see a bunch of people bringing up horse manure as an input material. And it is the pretty much the exclusive manure that we use in our compost is horse manure. So it's very, very effective at making good compost. We do have a relationship with the horse farmers, not farmers, but the horse borders, um, I guess. It's a stable for horses. Um, if they're giving antibiotics, if they're giving dewormers or anything like that, they separate that manure and it goes into a completely different pile. So we don't receive any of that material because a lot of those chemicals that they give animals will make it through into the manures and can really hinder your composting process. Yeah, almost any manure is going to be fantastic to use. Even, even, even human manure could be very good to use as long as the human is eating the correct things, right? So um, there is no, there's no manure out there that we cast off and say, no, never use this. Um, but with all of our input materials, we say, put on your detective hat and really look into the story of how it's being produced. Um, and, you know, with the horse manure in general, we found that if we incentivize the farmer by paying them for the manure and we pay a, a very nice price for them, they don't have any issue uh, separating things out for us because they can pay their people more to do that and everybody's happy. So um, when we need to find good in, in ingredients, we you know, toss a little money at the producers. And, you know, now it's like, they're not just making money from boarding their horses. Now, even when the horses go to the bathroom, they're making money. So they're really happy about it. But you do want to check out, uh, you know, check out the story on any manure you're using. And, uh, you know, people that have been treating their animals well are the ones that will, they'll basically fill out an application for their horse's manure. They'll be like, you don't understand how well we treat these horses. They eat diverse foods. Their pastures are always green. They get massages every Sunday. Like, uh, you know, they, the people know when they're good manure producers and it is a fun part of the job to really uh, look into that. So don't discount horses just because they have a bad rep uh, for the anti-wormers. Yeah, and I um, I would love to key on that question about manures with something that came up just yesterday for me on Facebook, uh, where I saw someone asking, like, is this a good way to do compost? And he explained it and all, and he's using chicken manure. And I said, what's the temperature getting up to? Because I'm a little concerned about human pathogens, and maybe you shouldn't use that like on root crops and all. And, uh, and he said, what do you mean human pathogens? It's chicken manure. <laughs> And I was like, oh no, like there's so many misconceptions out there because humans can, we can get some pretty 
terrible diseases from animals. And this is why we always emphasize, and you can look on our YouTube channel where Elaine talks about this, we have to get all the material in the compost hot enough, long enough, which is a real balancing act, right? How much high nitrogen do you have in there? How much moisture do you have in there? What's the shape, like the size of the pile? All those kind of things go into this because we're trying to hit a sweet spot where if it if we let the bacteria especially reproduce so quickly that they generate so much heat, they'll use up the oxygen and we'll get anaerobic pockets in the compost pile. But we also don't want it to be so low that we're not killing these pathogens effectively, right? And so that's like one of the first filter of good compost is that thermophilic filter, that heat filter. And then we talked about this a little bit here. The next thing is you want lots of diverse soil microorganisms or, or compost microorganisms in this case, um, so that they are competing with anything that falls in from the air, right? So that they're inhibiting things, so that they're um, consuming, right? Some of these uh, uh, organisms that we focus on, like, like nematodes, can actually consume these pathogens when they're in there. And that's the maturation phase of the, file, the pile. And, um, you know, really, as you see that fungal dominance go up, and all over time, you're talking about creating a better and better environment within that compost to where you're going to have thriving, non scary, <laughs> beneficial organisms. And anything that could be scary to us humans or our animals or our plants is going to be, um, you know, minimized in that pile, that population. So, yeah. Okay, let's move on because we don't have infinite time. Oh, this is another compost question. So Scott asks <laughs> if straw makes good browns for compost. What say you, panel? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Basically, easy. if it if it's visually brown, it's a brown material. If it's visually green, it's a green material. It's pretty much that simple. Well, there's still the stems. Yeah, but you know, so like a lot of the times when you're you know looking for your brown materials, yeah, wood chips are obviously our preferred. Um, deciduous wood chips are preferred or aged coniferous wood chips um but yeah straw can be a great fill-in um either hay straw or rice straw either or and i think a good strategy too is to is diversity of inputs as well i mean i like it when i can add wood chip and i can add straw um you know i've i've worked with a number of you know on farm or large-scale producers where it's basically cow manure and straw and that's the only two inputs that's it Oh boy. Yeah. You know, your diversity of organisms in that compost is going to be really, really low. Uh, the more diverse inputs typically will result in a more diversity of microorganisms in your finished compost. So yeah, use straw. The only thing that you have to be a little bit worried about straw is that some of the straw producers, they will actually use an herbicide to kill and desiccate the crop. And then they'll cut it up and, you know, then bale it into straw. And I think in those scenarios, you might get a fairly large load of herbicide um, in, in that um, in that straw bale. So knowing your history of where you're getting that straw. And that, that's, you know, when, when Jen and I were working as far as, you know, specking kind of a straw for her place, we knew we wanted to use straw as a mulch. So it was like, all right, well, let's try to get rice straw. And if we can, let's get organic rice straw. And, um, and and that worked out really, really well uh, because we were going to have that herbicide load. And then again, we talked about, you know, rice as far as not germinating very well on the soil profile. So it, it, it was a good product to be able to use. Yeah, I saw actually there was a question um, where somebody is in an area of the world where they just there's not a lot of trees, there's not a lot of woody materials around. And in in that case, like, yet you're going to have to be creative with your brown materials. So um, straw or any sort of weeds from the garden or, you know, any sort of more durable um, vegetative growth that you could use or maybe even cardboard if you have to trying to avoid inks and glues and things like that. Um, in some situations, we just have to be really creative with what our brown materials are because we don't have the option to be, uh, you know, to have that crazy diversity that we're really aiming for. And if you have the area, you can always uh, cultivate something for building some compost piles. It's like a trade off, all right? Sometimes is what I have to do mm -hmm. until you can find partners. Once you show to your neighbors all the power, all the benefits that you're bringing, 
partners will come up and then you can divide this effort to find material and build the compost piles together. Okay, well, one thing I wanna say here before we move on, because the word straw came up, is over Christmas, my nephew was like, hey, what's the difference between straw and hay? And I said, oh, that's a good question. And like, it's something sometimes people think is interchangeable, but the straw is gonna have a much wider C to N ratio, right? Because it's usually a crop, like a grain crop or something, where the plant has moved a lot of its nutrients into the grain or the, the fruiting body, which we've then harvested with a combine or by hand or whatever. And then the straw is like that leftover material. It's very carbon rich, but hay is intentionally cut at the peak of its um, nutritional value, right? Ideally, and it can be cut in different ways too. They can actually crimp off the bottom of the hay so that as it dries, it, the juices don't leak out of it, right? Because they're the, the part that's nourishing the animal. And so hay can be, a valuable addition to a compost pile as well, but it's going to be higher in. And you want to make sure that whoever's cutting that hay is not necessarily giving you a ton of seeds, which hay producers don't want hay crops to go to seed anyway. Again, they want to cut it when it's at that sweet spot for its its own nutrition. But especially when it comes to, um, you know, thinking about things like alfalfa, right that's gonna it's a legume the alfalfa hay is gonna be a really high-end material because of that versus a straw which is going to be very carbon rich all right so this is kind of a question straight to jen but i think we can have a discussion on it as well um mark asks how did you apply your solid compost onto the ground or underground in what quantities we're uh, prepping compost for vine. Oh, for vine plants, especially so um, tomatoes and that kind of thing. Right. Um, yeah. So what I did when I started my farm, and and definitely um, get info from the panelists on this because they may have different advice. But I I put down. I just built everything on top of my soil. I had I pulled you know pulled a giant tarp over the area to um, you know, convert all of the green grasses that were there in the weeds and those just got eaten up over the year and, you know, wiped out all my star thistle. And then, um, you know, I just came in and dumped the compost on top. I did not rip the ground. I did not rototill it in. I just let it sit there and I let it sit there for, I had time on my side. And, um, you know, when you're farming and growing all this stuff, you just kind of have to weigh what your options are. Um, if I hadn't had a lot of time uh, to get up and running, I'd probably would have gone ahead and done maybe an initial ripping of the ground or something like that and um, let it incorporate a little bit more further down into the ground to really open up that soil. But I had time on my side and so I just let it sit there I think for maybe four months before I had planted into it. I was able to put it down in late fall um, and I did a good three inches. But um, you know, I would definitely get info from Brian on that. Um, you know, that's kind of, you know, more conventional organic farming approach versus um, how they would start a bed. And I'd love to hear their answer on that. Sure. You know, one of the things we always look at is there's so many different ways to be able to use compost. Um, you know, one form is the solid compost, which is, you know, the compost that you've made. The other are liquid amendments where you're making extracts and teas. But when you're focusing just on the solid compost, you kind of have to ask yourself a lot of questions. What am I trying to achieve by putting this compost down? Am I just using it as an inoculum to be able to try to get the biology into the soil profile? Or is the soil so poor in organic matter that I really want to be able to increase the organic matter and I'm going to use the comp solid compost as a key component into doing that you know, as quickly as I possibly can? So when you start asking those questions, you kind of develop a plan of how you want to be able to do it. For me, if I'm in a you know, brand new project where we need to break up compaction and we're going to use mechanical means, um, I might actually till in uh, an a, a amount of compost to help kind of really bump up the organic matter while we're breaking up the compaction. And, you know, some people like say, whoa, whoa, you're talking about tilling and I'm very much a no-till type of person, but we may till one last time. 
Um, and that can be in the form of subsoiling, you know, key line plowing, or actually tilling, just to do that first breakup of the compacted zones. Um, and then after that, we want to take strategies where we're not applying you know, tillage if we possibly can. In other scenarios, we just will top dress, like in our you know, grapevines, they're already established, or in our orchards um, that we're working with, we'll use a, a, a compost spreader that a lot of times they have the ability to direct the compost either to the sides or the middles or both, you know, that type of thing, and we'll do a top dress. Uh, sometimes we're going to be putting out a cover crop that um, we need, maybe we broadcast the seed. We'll put the seed out there and then do a top dress of compost on top of that. And then maybe a top dress with some mulch on top of that. It, you know, you have to talk, you know, know your seeds um, and just so that uh, we can kind of cover that soil until the cover crop can come up and, and grow. Uh, there's other scenarios where, we're, let's say we're in a, a tree situation where we may actually drill, you know, auger out two-inch holes three foot deep and fill those holes full of compost to break through compaction zones and then to add a lot of organic matter, um, you know, in those holes. So, boy, there are just so many different techniques. You just kind of have to assess what you're trying to accomplish and then apply the right technique to that. Anybody else want to jump in? I mean, just, we try to get it in any way we can fit it. Um, I always tell people it's like, I, I mean, still, I, I've got some epic machinery that's, I mean, it's, 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 I have a, a dream sprayer that we use, but at my house, uh, I use a five gallon bucket and a watering can. And even sometimes I'll just splash the water out of the bucket onto the plants. It's very low tech stuff. And my at home garden looks gorgeous. I mean, I, I, I just, I get the tea, the extract out however I can, I, you know, but then um, I can also think back, like I've used little sprayers that I've picked up that are, you know, completely, they're destroying biology when I'm spraying out, you know, they're not the right sprayers for the job, but they still worked good. So, I mean, I've used everything to apply compost extract. Did she freeze for anyone else? Yeah, I think yes. uh, Keisha and Casey's yeah. network froze. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Keisha, we lost you for a couple minutes. If you can repeat your last two or three sentences, please. <laughs> I, I think I just said I, I agree with Brian. <laughs> oh, In my funny. experience, it's almost always a good idea to agree with Brian. <laughs> About 99.5% no. of the time. Um, I would love to take this opportunity to tap into something Jen and Brian that you mentioned towards the end of the presentation, which was about the the nutrient management, right? Because mm -hmm. this is it's the it's the why of compost. Why are we putting out compost? And a lot of people come with a with, they've been told like compost is full of nutrients. So then they think, oh yeah, I want lots of nutrients for my plants. And it's sort of like replacing the industrial ag chemical model with just a different source of nutrients right but what we're actually trying to do here is make an intervention into the mindset of everybody in this space you know the soul food web school gets to be at the at the nexus of a very important conversation and we're like it's the microorganisms it's not the nutrients that are the keystone that holds the whole thing together it's the mic it's the microorganisms now Jen, I love that you said, I know I'm taking nutrients out of this system when I'm selling things at market. And I want to make sure I'm putting enough back because sometimes I think we have, I, I hear discussions where I think, hmm, if we aren't measuring the flow rate of nutrients from our parent material into, you know, an organic matter into the crop versus out, we could still get into a problem where we're, we're taking more than is coming in. Right, it's about rate. Um, so compost does have a lot of nutrients in it, right? De especially depending on the source of the materials from the compost, as well as these cover crops that you've mentioned, like bringing a, a leguminous cover crop in to fix nitrogen into your soil. So it's worth understanding that the nutrients, it's not that they're not important, it's that if the microorganisms are thriving, if we have this robust soil food web, that's telling us that our nutrient cycling is going really well, right? Those predators are there, so they're eating the bacteria and fungi, releasing nutrients, and it's like, it's what you're looking at and what you're trusting 
I see so much when it comes to nutrients, the, the, the training from, you know, I came from a land grant university, the training from the land grant university is sort of like the human is the engineer of this whole thing. We're at the center of it. We're the busy little bee that's fixing everything and monitoring everything versus, Hey, we're having a relationship of like, we're partnering. It's the plants and the microorganisms that do the magic in there because we don't photosynthesize, the plants do. They're the ones adding the carbon ultimately. And the microorganisms, if humans disappeared from this planet, the planet would mostly go on. But if microorganisms disappeared, everything would collapse, right? They're the essential workforce of the biome as, as Dee Dee Pursehouse says. So I just, you know, like that's a huge part to me about the question of compost is how much, when, you know, you get it in there, it's about monitoring that soil food web. It's about using those indicators. Like, are you seeing your fungal population go down? Well, maybe it's really time to make an intervention and say, why? How can I stop the, the thing that's hurting my fungi? How can I get the fungi back? And that's when the compost comes in to the situation. Not just a, a, a catch all like, well, my plants need nutrients, so I need to put out more compost. <laughs> Yeah, it's um, I, I could add to that. Um, it's pretty interesting because I I had that philosophy in the beginning. You putting down compost, and that was my way of supplying MPK and hopefully don't know what's in it the micro uh, nutrients that the plant needs too. And it's like feeding the plant. And um, I wasn't using my soil. If you think about it, it's it, now that I think about it, it's almost like using it in a hydroponic sense because um, I'm just giving the plant the nutrient. The soil's there to hold the plant upright, but I'm really not utilizing what the soil is capable of providing for the plant. And compost is two things, if it's good. It's NPK and some great stuff that's in there, maybe potassium for potato peels and all those kind of cool things and nitrogen that's decomposed. It is food, but it is also all of the microbiology, which is um, providing that mechanism to the plants to be able to get stuff themselves. And it's, you know, a habitat for the microorganisms to live on. And so um, it's, it's like a, <laughs> I don't know, it's a, <laughs> it's, a, it's a complex thing. You're doing both at the same time, but it's the other half that if you start embracing and focusing on that, you no longer have to worry about how much N, P, and K. And, you know, if I were starting a farm now, even knowing what I know, I'd probably still do an initial soil test just to see what my soil looked like. I'd want to know that for me to go, whoa, I'm coming in and, and look at all this phosphorus I have there, or I have none. Um, because maybe I would want to like add a little bit of some kind of mineral, just initially getting going. I'd, I'd want to know what I had and what it was telling me is, um, you know, in my site, I put down so much compost. I don't think I needed to. Um, you know, I had rich life on my slope. I had all those weeds. I knew it was growing and I probably went overkill to get more organic matter going on in the beginning. Um, but that's okay. You know, the years go on, you learn, you figure it out, but, um, just to take some kind of blanket advice of, oh yeah, put down three inches of this and do this and do that. You really have to look at your own situation and know what you have. Are you growing grapes? Um, you know, I've heard, um, you know, I have a vineyard on my property that I don't use, um, but they're really tough. They like a good mineral soil. They don't necessarily need to tons of compost. So know what you're growing, know what your soil looks like, um, and really listen to yourself on that and get, get a, a good breadth of experience with your soil type so that you make the right decision. Maybe you don't really need to add compost, maybe just mulch will work, or maybe your soil is really devoid and rocky and you need to get a lot of stuff in there and, um, and do something different. You know, I reacted to my site and my specifics and, um, I still probably didn't make the right choice, but <laughs> it worked out. <laughs> I got it taken care of you know I probably went in a little heavier with the compost than I needed to so um you know just um, listen to yourself and get good advice from other people and and figure it out for your particular situation yeah this is precisely the critical thinking that we work in the school with our students it's just like work with nature one of Elaine's most famous mantra we need to see ourselves as part of this whole system right and uh we are here, we are at halfway, half of the planet that we are shifting our mindsets to more um, biological agriculture, more really pay attention on what nature is trying to tell us every single second. 
And we just need to be careful because we were trained to just like rely on numbers. What those numbers are telling me. But we need to remind constantly to open up our minds and listen to nature. What they're telling me. It's case by case. One recipe or one strategy that works perfectly for me might not work perfectly for my neighbor because their land has a different story. So it's the whole puzzle that we need to look for. And Jen, I'm impressed with your farm and your hard work. It's paying off. So keep going. It's really inspiring. I absolutely agree. There is one more thing I want to represent here in the whole world, in all the crazy things that have happened in the history of this planet, there are soils that are completely lacking something. Like they're highly weathered, maybe they have one part per million total phosphorus, that happens. So it's not like we're saying, never pay attention to this or never check it or whatever. The idea is that with sufficient organic matter and microorganisms, the vast majority maybe all of the world's soils could be highly productive, right? So maybe in the transition process, somebody is going, I absolutely have to add something that's gonna really bump up my phosphorus a little bit. Well, it all just comes back to check what that does to the soil food web. Find the right concentration of that in your soil that's not harming your organisms, right? I study mycorrhizal fungi. If you get that available phosphorus pool too high, it starts harming the mycorrhizal fungi because the plants don't need them, they don't feed them, it's just a whole, a whole loop. So more is not always better. <laughs> but at the same time, there are soils that are like, you know, well, they're almost completely lacking in selenium or something. And that's where Elaine really focuses on, you want 3% or more organic matter in your soil to really make sure that you have the basis, the, the resource base, because the microorganisms aren't making minerals. They're transforming the minerals. And if those, if those aren't there in the parent material, we need to bring them in somehow. Compost is, is one of the best ways to do that. Okay, what size farm does this method apply to? Have you got examples of scale? This is from Claire. Carla, I see you excited. Could I ask you to take that one? <laughs> And then we'll go around the horn. I would jump in first. Sorry, guys, I couldn't hold myself. It's one of the things that amuses me about the system is that no matter the size, the question is really like, how uh, are, how much time and effort are you investing and in how you're going to scalonate with uh, rationale? It's not that you're just going to jump in and start all the area at once. First, you have to understand what material you have available to make the best compost you can. Then you have to scan the area, what's lacking, what can I do? So planning is the key. And if you have very good resources, size doesn't matter. It just might take longer for you to um, change the system in the whole area, but you can go from your small backyard or pot, uh, your plants, uh, in the pots inside your room to large scale farms. I have students in Brazil that they are just going nuts with big farms with soybean. So just keep challenging yourself. Yeah, you know, I have clients that uh, span the gamut from small residential properties, you know, like Jen's Market Garden, you know, Jen said she farms on like a third of an acre uh, to farms that are in the thousands of acres. And, and really, the um, the principles are exactly the same, from the smallest to the largest. What really changes from small scale farming uh, to large scale farming is the techniques and methodologies that we use. When you're doing it at scale, and you need to go out to thousands of acres of cropland, you're you're talking about you know using like an irrigation system to push extracts through. Um, where in a smaller situation, like in Jen's farm, that may not be necessary. You don't have to go through that expense or that, that process. So really, it comes down to really techniques are the difference behind them, but the principles are really exactly the same. And honestly, on a lot of these large scale farms, it's the equipment is the same. It just needs slight modifications to be able to handle a higher particulate load in the sprayers, for instances, or maybe a few pumps need to be changed that are a little less damaging. So 
yeah like but just like brian we go from anywhere from uh you know landscaping in somebody's front yard all the way up to you know these thousand acre farms so yeah it really you can you can apply this anywhere and it's just as effective i it, i'd also like to add to across crops as well it's not crop specific either so we like again I, in a landscape we're applying the same compost tea and extract to the grass as we are to the trees and shrubs. And I'm sure you could get a lot more specific if you're really trying to dial in each, you know, growing medium, but the same tea applied across an entire landscape, everything is still getting that benefit. And the same with almond trees versus uh, olive trees versus persimmons versus mulberry. So it's pretty diverse and <laughs> it's application. It does look like Luke dropped a link in the chat um, with the case study that's a large scale operation. It may or may not be the same as this one, but Adam York, we've had him on here before. And, you know, he's figured out how to scale this up and apply uh, compost extracts through like a pivot irrigation system on large scale corn and soy operation. Um, there's just more and more examples out there where it's kind of funny because, you know, I, I have peers that are still in the university setting and I pay attention to what's being said over there in extension about different things and on Twitter and all. And there's a lot of people that are just like so dismissive of Regen Ag and they're just like, well, you know, these microorganisms can't survive when they put them out there because the soil conditions are different or whatever. And I'm like, OK, I talk to people all the time that are making this happen. So like, how does that compute? It's it's that mindset shift. It's that um, opening up to a new set of possibilities. And one of my favorite examples of just Regen Ag in general done at scale, I got to interact with a farmer that's like, he's over in the very dry part of Colorado in the, you know, near the Rocky Mountains in the US and um, was a potato farmer and was like, I get eight inches of precipitation a year, mostly in the form of snow. Here's how I did it. I woke up one day and I said, I'm sick of doing what my dad always did on this farm and waking up every day and saying, what do I have to kill today? What nematode do I have to kill? What fungi do I have to kill? What, you know, kill, kill, kill. What pesticide input? And he said, I'm gonna start taking that money that I'm spending on killing things. And I'm gonna invest it into bringing my soil to life and filling it with microorganisms and other, you know, infrastructure things. So planting peas into potatoes that are already somewhat established, all these creative ideas, he's making it work with that little bit of precipitation because he has reestablished a soil sponge, right? A living soil, like the skin of the planet, just like our skin. It's not dried out and cracking and peeling anymore. It's been revived with uh, some kind of, uh, you know, investment there. And it's not without costs. Like nobody is selling, uh, you know, magic in a bottle here. There's investment of time, resources, all of that, new equipment, all of that, but it, it can be scaled up. This guy is making his entire livelihood off of the this potato farm. And instead of spending all that money on killing things, he's spending it on bring his soil keeping his soil thriving keeping that ecosystem healthy and i just want to add another thought there too is you know we talked a lot about um, you know nutrient cycling and, and pest and disease but you know, it's really also building a lot of resilience and farmers are always looking for resilience you know jen used the example that when we had that massive you know atmospheric river that came through and really had a major rain event that we didn't have the erosion didn't have the washway and we, we see that you know especially in the midwest like big corn and soy farmers that are starting to really focus on soil health and soil biology and building soil structure that they are very resilient to a lot of those climatic changes as well so just want to add that point that's it mm -hmm. perfect let's move on just keeping an eye on the time here we got a few more questions what do you use to get compost extract and any uh, any cloth can any cloth do the work an old pair of socks or tights for example <laughs> <laughs> i love it let's talk about the 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 parameters that we like to use for filtering compost extracts and and all of that anyone want to tee up and take it um well uh so i um you know use a 
I used a couple things. I think um, I had at one point, um, it was a it was a filter for paint, you know, like you can strain paint to get the clumps out of it. I had some of those um, in, in my garage and then I've purchased actual um, bags that are specific to compost extract and teas and there's all different micron levels for what um, type of particulate it allows to go through and you definitely need to have something fine enough that the microbes can get out of which is probably pretty much anything I'm sure pantyhose or socks would work the issue you run into is um, you know I had tried a couple of different things and it's uh, the durability of it so my particular compost is made with wood chips so I have lots of little bark pieces that are still in there little sticks and twigs and when you're kind of like massaging this or crunching it down uh, or filling up the bag and, and kind of working with it um, it'll poke holes in something that's not um, you know kind of meant to um, take a lot of abuse so um, one of my favorite things was um, the bag that came with the um, tea lab brewer. It was like a five gallon compost tea lab. And that little bag is just indestructible. I mean, my dogs grabbed it and ripped into it and it stays just fine. And I'm it, so um, just find something that's going to hold up. Um, because, you know, it, it's nice to just not have something that's like more disposable. I'm sure you could make um, sock work or um, anything like that, but you're just going to run into it kind of clogging and hard to clean out um, and bits stuck into it. So um, I'd probably go for like a really good, uh, you know, filtered um, compost tea specific item <laughs> that's meant to kind of hold up just personally so that you're not frustrated at the end of the day. Yeah, just to uh, complement, we are looking for a mesh around 400 microns. So we're going to allow the biology pass through, but you're not going to have the big chunks from the compost in your extracts and teas. So you're going to make your life a bit easier when applying and make sure the biology is going with. Yeah, and I guess on that point too is, yeah, the paint strainer bags are great because they're so cheap, but yeah, they are cheap as she, as she was saying. Um, but they, you know, they, they are effective, especially if you're not worried, like whatever spraying equipment that you're going to be using isn't, doesn't have any kind of like restrictions. Those work great and they're cheap and super easy to replace. Um, even when they rip, you know, I've had some that are just like, you could, you know, it looks like a hockey mat or like a mask at some point, cause there's so many holes in it, but you know, as long as, you know, you're keeping the majority of the large chunks out, um, you know, you could still use that if you're just, you know, putting it out by hand or putting it through a watering can. Um, but yeah, once you get into like the, you know, more mechanical systems where you're putting it through drip systems or you're putting it through some kind of spray rig, yeah, you want to typically stick to that 400 uh, micron mesh sizing. We had some interesting, it was, we had something made because Brian actually had shared with us, I, I believe it's coming from your project where you use the hose. Mm -hmm um spray instead of instead of injecting and sticking your hands in the cold water and massaging you just use your hose and spray it which is like ugh, of course easy um so we had these metal trays made what we did was we went to the honey industry and so when they're a lot of the times when you're sifting honey they have these metal trays with mesh inlaid in the bottom and clips that clip onto a five gallon bucket um and so we just basically got you know got a hold of someone in china and had them switch out the mesh on the bottom of those honey uh, trays. And so now you can just clip those into the bucket and spray over the top and it's super easy. But it's really like, once you start doing it, you see a lot of different ways that you can go about it. You can also pour all the all of the compost into the bucket and stir it and then just pour it back out. It just depends on what machine you're gonna spray it out with or if you're even gonna use a machine. <laughs> Yeah, they also, they brought up something that reminded me of something I was gonna look into getting. Um, they have, um, stainless steel um, like brewer baskets for people that make beer and like the hops go in there or something and like the mash kind of thing for like home brewers and they're a stainless steel mesh mechanism and I was like ooh, that clips onto the side it sounds like just like what you're talking about with the honey where um, you know you can just put that in there hose it around and dump the thing out and never have to worry about having this um, cloth type thing that you know your dog's going to grab or you're going to misplay. I mean, if you've got like this nice thing that's going to hold up for a couple years, and once you're making extract and you're doing it on a regular basis, um, you just really want to have something that's convenient and gives you joy and you're not frustrated with. And um, you know, for sure, if you're just trying this out to see if it works and you see results, grab the socks, grab the tights, whatever you've got. 
Um, <laughs> yep. but you're doing it on a regular basis. You just really want to streamline it for yourself and have something that's cool, easy to clean because you know you've got to hose it back out. And um, the stainless steel idea um, seems really nice because it's not going to rust. Um, it's something that you could leave out if you don't have to be particular with it. So I was going to look into that as well. Once you once you have made a couple thousand gallons of compost extract by hand, you start to develop these pet peeves about. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm sure I can speak for everyone. Cleaning the bag is just like I'm finished, and I'm like, now I have to clean the bag, and it's not always easy. <laughs> it's not always easy. Sometimes the little dirt particles collect in the corners, and it's just. Uh, we really like everything to be very clean in all of our practices, so it's like just a little bit of organic material in there can just really bum out my moment. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I think this might be our last question because I don't want to keep people too much past the hour. But how do you make sure the micronutrients are in the soil, not just the macronutrients? So that actually goes back a bit to the compost discussion. It comes back to um, having all of those key functional groups of microorganisms right? It's the bacteria and fungi that are going to be harvesting every kind of nutrient for their own bodies. They want all the zinc and calcium and magnesium. They're going to pull it out of organic matter and they're going to go in. What is it, Brian, that you like to say? They're going to go into the cage and pull it, pull it out of the soil as well, the parent material, the mineral parts of the soil. Right, uh, uh, the mineral pools and the exchangeable pools. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. they're the so miners. It's like, they're, it's like those things can be cage they can be physically in um you know protected by you know, think of like the inside of a rock has minerals in it but it, those minerals are physically protected well get bacteria and fungi in there they're chewing on all those edges all the time they're trying to feed themselves then it would all get stuck in their bodies and i think this is one of the reasons why sometimes people find that adding a lot of wood chips will tie up the nitrogen in their soil is that it's a whole bunch of carbon. They get a bloom of bacteria, maybe even some fungi. But what those things want to do is tie all that up, have it in their own tissues. That's why we need the predators. That's why we need the amoebae, the, the flagellates, the bacterial and fungal feeding nematodes. They go in there and they catch the bacteria and they catch the fungi, right? And they, and they, they, pull those nutrients out of them they eat them and but then they excrete a lot of waste and for, for for them it's waste but for our plants it's food so that's really a huge part of of why this goes on here and why i think is really valuable jen that you've talked about um wanting to get that cover crop into your system because the plants are sharing huge amount of the sunlight that they're collecting as sugars and so it's a principle of regenerative agriculture that if we can keep a living root in that soil more time through the year, right? Maybe you maybe you can't keep it there all the time, but maybe you can keep it there 85% of the time, right? And that's better than 50% of the time. It's feeding those organisms, keeping those populations thriving, and then they're continuing to chew on all the minerals, all the pebbles, all the, all the sand, all the silt um, to, to find these micro and macronutrients. Well said, Adam. You know, and that's the beauty about this kind of system. As a farmer, you know, it's that whole thing where you look at the, okay, what kind of deficiency I'm seeing in the leaves. I'm seeing the yellowing here and green ribs. It's this type of deficiency. And then I'm trying to pull my tissue uh, samples and my, my, my chemical samples. And I am trying to figure out when does a plant need molybdenum versus this versus that. And in reality, the way we approach this is that the relationship between the plants and the biology, the plants are going to essentially inform the microbiology community what kind of nutrients that they need. And that's how that nutrient cycling is going to work. And it's going to deliver essentially the nutrients that it needs when it needs it versus you trying to figure out you know, how to do that. And it's very easy to get that wrong from a farmer standpoint where you either don't add enough or you add too much. And now, you know, if you add too much in excess, you can block the absorption of other nutrients and go through a whole slew of other problems. Uh, and, and there are farmers who have figured that out. I mean, there's no doubt, you know, that they, they kind of have the right feel and know, but it's easy, very easy to make mistakes and, and not give the plants exactly what they need or overload them. So 
we want our our allies in the soil to do that work what they've evolved to do anyways with those plants one of the things that you've taught me though um i mean this specific question how do you know that the micronutrients are in the soil um you know i would say you know do do a soil test do a one-time soil test and just see um you know it, it's going to tell you it, it, all of that stuff right it's going to tell you what you have and and but also at the same time, if you see something that's like in a low amount, like my soil test, um, you know, I was like low according to the soil, soil test on calcium and I applied calcium, but I didn't see my blossom end rot go away. <laughs> so um, just make sure you have them there, but don't worry necessarily how much is there because you can have a low amount on those micronutrients, right? Like maybe you have just a little bit of boron, right? You don't need a lot, but maybe you've got like, you know, oddly kind of low. Don't worry about it. <laughs> if it's there and you're applying the microbiology to the soil, those little organisms are going to extract plenty, right? And give it to the plant. Um, the soil tests show you how much is in your soil based on the way that they determine they're going to process that soil. But that doesn't tell you how much is getting to your plants. Um, you could have soil that's really high in microbiology and you have low, low, low on everything with calcium and magnesium like I did. And it got there. I never added, um, you know, saw that come up in my soil test, but it still shows that I'm low in all those things, but my plants are getting absolutely what they need. So, um, you know, Brian has suggested before when I started farming, cause I had similar questions like, you know, well, it shows that I'm low on phosphorus I should add. Right. And he's like, no, 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 you don't need to do that. You, you know, um, like Adam was saying, there are some soils that are devoid of all of this stuff, but again, like a simple eye test to me is like, if you've got healthy weeds and some kind of vegetation growing in that spot, um, right there, that tells you that your soil is fine. Um, it's just build the biology and the micronutrients will be available to the plant when it needs it. And, and it's going to determine that stuff way better than we can, um, unless you want to spend, you know, tons of money getting sap analysis tests throughout the season to kind of say, oh, it needs just a little bit more of this and try to mm -hmm. steer everything at that outer nutrient level. Um, so much simpler to let the plant figure it out, um, have a beer instead, <laughs> and just not worry about that. <laughs> That's my approach to farming, for sure. <laughs> I guess, Jen, this presentation has been so great. I just want to say, well, there's still a second, and I, instead of talking about the question, I enjoyed your presentation so much, and I just, I love your take on things, and you're, like, I realize you're learning from Brian, but, like, your take is absolutely different. <laughs> I, I really, I appreciate so much um, all the little things that you've brought up and uh, what you're learning from your process as you go. It's just been very refreshing um, to, to be here with you today. So thank you so, so much. much for sharing great with us. you guys, too. Yeah. <laughs> and I Brian, good job that. teaching her. She's great. <laughs> hey, it was easy. It was easy. Jen was already there. <laughs> She's one of those ideal clients who's like, hey, I, I'm going to learn. I'm, I, I think this is the right approach. I'm in. You know, it was like, great. Perfect. Perfect. Well, um, I put up the splash screen of, to let people, to remind folks that we'll have um, a, another webinar on January 31st. I think, Casey, it looks like you'll be back for that one with one I of will. your clients. So that's very exciting. And I just want to thank everybody on the panel. Jen, I hope we can have you back again because there's so much more. I'd love to learn about the, the transition that you went through with this land and, and the ongoing lessons that you're learning. I can absolutely- It was really fun. Thank you. It was great to participate. Yeah. So I Perfect. love the program. <laughs> <laughs> well, and thank you to the other panelists, people that are more associated with the school in various ways our tech crew, our marketing crew, everybody that helped put this together. We really appreciate all of you, but we're going to call it quits for the people at home because we promised them about two hours. <laughs> well, thank you, Adam, for hosting. Yeah, yeah thanks, Adam. Thank thanks you, for hosting. Everyone. I mean, it, might, it was easy. I didn't have to host this time. It was fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> Here's hanging out. Bye-bye. Right, Bye. Hi, everybody. Don't, Don't forget, forget to, to click, click that, that like button, button, subscribe to our channel, and ring the notification bell to stay updated with all our new videos.